night when I went home, drunk as I could be. There's another mule in the stable where my mule ought to be. Come here, honey. Today we're taking a look at Little Nightmares from developer Tarzir Studios, who previously worked in conjunction with Media Molecule to develop DLC for Little Big Planets 1 and 2, as well as the PS4 port of Tearaway. In the game you play as a young girl named Six, who is trapped on an otherworldly floating vessel called the Maw. Aboard this ship are hellish creatures intent on devouring up little girls, and armed with only a raincoat and a lighter, Six aims to escape this nightmare and presumably return home. And that's basically our setup. It's simple, to the point, and leaves plenty to the imagination, which, in my opinion, is how games like this work the best. Little Nightmares isn't setting out to craft a story of epic proportions, but is instead narrowing its focus to the story of our main character and her, albeit brief, journey to make it out of this world alive. How did she get here? Where are her parents? Is this the real life, or is this just fantasy? Who knows, the game never explains and leaves us fumbling about in the dark from the very second we begin. As Six, you traverse through the inner workings and off-beaten paths of the Maw, moving about in a pseudo 2.5D world rife with environmental puzzles, disturbing creatures many times your size, and an off-putting atmosphere. Lots and lots of off-putting atmosphere. The environments you traverse range from the dank, mechanical, and cold underbelly of the ship to the strange domiciles of distorted furniture and unwelcoming kitchens, as well as the feudal Japanese-esque restaurant of the final act. The scenery alone is enough to set the tone to that of an unnerving fair. Signs of life from other children who may or may not have escaped can be seen everywhere you go, but noticeably become less and less prominent as the game progresses. Areas of great danger often show places where another child has lost their life while simply trying to make it through. Early on, you'll come across a room with a large eye that turns to stone any living thing it gazes. Upon entering this room, everything is very dark, to the point that you can only make out silhouettes of objects found within. When the eye opens up, the room is suddenly illuminated, showing the silhouettes to be that of an upturned bed with several child-sized statues littered about the room, twisted into an agonizing visage showing a once frightened soul recoiling then ceasing with their final moment frozen forever in time. This of course hammers into the player's head the atmosphere that is needed to maintain the game, but it also serves to educate the player as to what must be done in order to safely traverse the room. This is Environmental Game Design 101, a philosophy that Oh, so many games have thrown by the wayside these days in exchange for walls of text or a cutscene heavy-handedly telling the player what needs to be done. However, Little Nightmares doesn't hold the player's hand and lets the environment speak for itself. In fact, the game is so tightly designed that it may occasionally work against the atmosphere that's been built up so well, and as such, some moments of the game can become relatively predictable, pulling the punch of what would otherwise be a decent jump scare or moment of panic. Though I do think this design choice was intentional and counterintuitively works in the game's favor in regard to what it's trying to accomplish. For example, throughout the game, Six is sometimes crippled with hunger, losing her ability to sprint and move throughout the world with ease. When this occurs, the lights dim, the atmospheric ambiance grows quiet, and a haunting chant of a childlike choir pierces the silence, ceasing only when you find something to eat. The second time this happens, though, the only food you are able to find is in an open cage being munched on by a rat. Of course, anyone with half a brain knows that it's a trap, and upon entering the cage, a disembodied lanky arm reaches down and slams the cage shut. Predictable, and I'm sure everyone saw it coming. However, rather than just writing this off as lazy writing, let's take a look at what this moment accomplishes within the context of the setting and narrative, as well as what the game is trying to convey overall. For starters, we can assume from the toys in the area and the children in the beds that whatever these creatures are, they're either kidnapping or farming children for food. Since Six isn't initially found within one of these daycare-esque rooms, we can also assume that she's managed to hide from her captors and is no longer being fed regularly. Plus, with how bony she is and clues from the environment, such as a rope made of bed sheets, it's easy to draw the conclusion that she's been at this for a while. Thus, the hunger that plagues her is so great at this point that she, and by extension us, only see the food in the cage as a necessity that is unavoidable, and I could see the need for us to walk into an obvious trap purely as the only option of survival. However, the game could have accomplished Six getting captured just as well if instead of the cage, the food was simply lying on the ground and the lanky arm just reached down and grabbed us while we were eating. Also, having the room to the left side of the screen be accessible and well lit would make the player think that that's the next objective, causing the sudden appearance of the arm to be that much more frightening and jump scary. However, by doing it this way, there's suddenly this huge shift in tone as to what the game has been building up to this point. Think about it like this, you know how in in most horror games, the atmosphere and tension builds up to the point where you know that a jump scare is inevitable, but you just don't know when, and then suddenly it happens and you feel immediately relieved that it's over? Why is that? Well, it's because the brain doesn't like ambiguity, and horror games, at least the good ones, practically drown your brain in the ambiguous until it can't take it anymore, so when the game finally releases the valve in the form of a jump scare, your brain is like, oh, thank fucking Christ, it's over. And this works just fine for certain games, but now the developers have to start all over with the atmosphere and tension building, and since you've already seen a lot of their tricks, it's that much harder to get you back into the state of mind, which is why most horror games lose their effectiveness as the game progresses. But Little Nightmares isn't like that. Instead, the game deliberately sets you up for a jump scare 
there but then never gives it to you, instead choosing to do something predictable to just ever so slightly release some of the pressure as a slight reward for conquering that section of the game. And because of this slow release, the game always ensures that there's at least some ambiguity left over in your brain from one scene to the next, and as such can maintain a consistent tone throughout the entire experience. And I think this is an important distinction to make, because usually when something is predictable, it's to the detriment of the work, but here, the predictability is a deliberate eschewing of conventional horror tropes used to keep the player in a constant state of unease. At least that's the vibe I got while playing. Either way, what we are left with is a world that's filled to the brim with a personality that borrows from several other works, but uses them in such a way as to make them uniquely its own. Bookshelves and dressers found in the game's first act have notes of Alice in Wonderland, with the kitchen and restaurant of the second and third reminding me a great deal of several works from Hayao Miyazaki, most notably Spirited Away. The game also makes great use of color. Everything is bright, and each object is shaded to complement or contrast perfectly with its surroundings, but then the game deliberately mutes these wonderful hues to further that sense of unease within the player. But what I like best is probably the way in which the entire game never stops moving. Having the setting of the game take place on a floating ship means that everything is swaying back and forth in motion with the waves. The camera dances gently up and down and back and forth, preventing the player's eyes from ever truly focusing in on any individual component of the world, instead encouraging the eyes to drink in everything on screen all at once. Items that aren't tied down, are on wheels, or those that aren't of a substantial weight teeter about the room, following the motion set by the swaying camera, but at a slight delay, never quite able to catch the flow of the viewpoint. This creates a sort of mesmerizing feeling that sucks the player into this nightmare, and combined with the surreal designs of objects and characters within the world, the once bright but now muted colors and the soft, curvy forms of objects creates an atmosphere unlike anything I've ever experienced in a game. All this without a single line of dialogue, text, or cutscene. If nothing else, Little Nightmares is a masterclass of environmental storytelling and foreboding world design. Something else that the game does really well is by letting the player know exactly what's going on without actually showing them. A great deal of this game involves trying to hide, escape from, or sneak past one of the creatures so bent on cooking or devouring you, so you think that in order to make this work, the thing you are trying to avoid would have to be in your line of sight at all times. However, the game makes such great use of the rumble feature of your controller in conjunction with its brilliant sound design that even if an enemy is outside of your line of sight, you can easily imagine, with great accuracy, where they are located, allowing you to formulate your next move or devise a clever strategy. Think of it like this, have you ever been in a room with someone only for them to get up and move into the next room, out of your line of sight, but then you're able to hear them the entire time they're gone? As this happens, your mind paints a mental picture of where they are and what actions they're taking, and while you don't know exactly where they are or what they're doing, you can make an educated guess that it's fairly accurate. This is an incredibly hard thing to pull off in a game, and to this day I've only ever played a few games that have done it well, yet Little Nightmares seemingly accomplishes this without breaking a sweat, and it's one thing to make the action on screen engaging, but it's quite another to make that which cannot be seen engaging as well. Undoubtedly, the biggest criticism of this game is going to be in regard to its length. Well, not for me, as I happen to think the game should only be as long as they need to be, and that once you reach this point, you're only adding fluff and making your game worse, but I recognize that I'm in the minority when it comes to that sentiment. Little Nightmares is barely three hours long, and after playing a second time, I can tell you that it can casually be beaten in under two, and probably a lot faster if you are so inclined. But I happen to think that Little Nightmares is the perfect length, and was clearly developed by a talented team dedicated to making a fantastic three-hour experience rather than an unhinged sloppy slog fest. And because the game doesn't overstay its welcome, has a fairly satisfying ending and leaves me wanting more, I was compelled to play the game again. And only a single day later, finding myself having even more fun than the first time I played because now that I'm familiar with the game, I'm able to find all the secrets and clever world building that I missed the first time around. So yeah, I really like this game and definitely give it my personal recommendation, especially if you like games like Limbo and Inside, which I certainly do. Little Nightmares may not do anything revolutionary in terms of its mechanics, but its design is tight, its atmosphere is both enjoyable and unnerving, and it's easily the best game I've played so far this year. So go on and check it out if you haven't already.